Compared to their husbands, America's first ladies have mostly avoided scandal, but even they occasionally ran afoul of the press or their social and political circles. Here are some of the first ladies' missteps that became outright infamous moments. James Madison's wife, Dolly, is a national heroine for saving the Declaration of Independence and getting George Washington's portrait out of the White House as British forces were burning Washington during the War of 1812. But back when her husband served as Thomas Jefferson's Secretary of State, Dolly was a prime target for the Washington rumor mill. She was very much the center of attention, the life of any room, and at the same time, she knew exactly what she was doing. Jefferson never remarried after his wife's death in 1782, which meant there was no official first lady when he became president. Dolly likely stepped in to help Jefferson host events when female guests were involved, and it didn't take long for her critics to accuse her of being Jefferson's mistress. The anti-Dolly rhetoric ratcheted up in 1808, coincidentally right as James was making a bid for the presidency. James's enemies accused her of helping her husband win the 1808 election by getting intimate with various electors. The tactic failed, and James Madison became America's fourth president. Rachel Jackson was technically never the first lady. However, her very public scandal was a huge part of her second husband's political life and presidential campaigns. Rachel married a man named Louis Robards at 18. When the marriage failed, a jealous Robards accused her of multiple affairs. Among her alleged paramours was Andrew Jackson, whom Rachel met while he was a boarder in her mother's house. Rachel left Robards and moved to Natchez in Spanish Mississippi, where Andrew frequently visited her. Aware of the liaison, Robards accused his wife of eloping with another man in 1790, but didn't officially file for divorce until 1792, because he wanted a piece of his father-in-law's estate. Andrew and Rachel, meanwhile, believed she and Robards were already divorced and got married in March 1791. But the divorce wasn't finalized until 1793, making Rachel an adulteress and bigamist on paper. John Quincy Adams and his allies made the scandal a central part of the 1828 presidential campaign, calling Rachel unfit to be the first lady and a danger to national morals. She dreaded going to Washington and made the statement, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than live in that palace. Although she'd been found guilty of adultery, the strategy failed and Jackson won. But Rachel died shortly after his victory before his inauguration. Julia Tyler, who married President John Tyler in 1844, was born in 1820 to New York State Senator David Gardner and wealthy socialite Juliana Gardner. Because of her position in society, she was held to a strict code of conduct, which included limiting her public exposure outside of acceptable social events. In 1839, however, 19-year-old Julia showed an independence tree. Julia, I think of as the Madonna, you know, of first ladies. She loved publicity. That year, she agreed to pose for an advertisement for a dry goods store called Bogert and McCamley. In the ad, she posed alongside a man and carried a handbag on which was written, I'll purchase at Bogert and McCamley's number 86 9th Avenue. Their goods are beautiful and astonishingly cheap. Julia wasn't named in the advert, but she was identifiable thanks to her nickname, the Rose of Long Island, printed at the bottom. It was the first time a woman of her stature appeared in an ad, a big no-no for the time. A high-status single girl wasn't supposed to lend her face and name to a commercial enterprise, much less pose with a man who wasn't her husband. Her parents had impressed upon her the importance of finding a good marriage, and the ad was not a good look. In the end, the scandal faded when the Gardner family left New York for Washington, D.C. in Europe, where Julia was presented before French King Louis-Philippe I. Mary Todd Lincoln, wife of President Abraham Lincoln, was believed to suffer from mental disorders and a problematic spending habit. The evidence comes primarily from the diaries of Senator Orville Browning, who represented Illinois from 1861 to 1863. Among the entries is a conversation with one Judge David Davis, who called the First Lady a, quote, natural-born thief. Davis accused Mrs. Lincoln of stealing White House property and racking up $2,000 bills for clothes, around $70,000 in today's money. She was always one of the women when she entered. Everybody wanted to see what Mrs. Lincoln was wearing. An employee identified as Stackpole said she spent federal money on personal luxuries such as the silver plate and embezzled money from the Treasury with a White House gardener through manipulated invoices and a payment to a non-existent servant. And the rumors didn't end with her White House tenure. In 1868, Mary Todd tried to sell her White House wardrobe under an assumed name, at least until auctioneers convinced her to reveal her true identity and provide letters of authentication. The idea was to interest buyers in a piece of Lincoln memorabilia, but news of the auction ended up in the press, which denounced her for conduct unbefitting of her station. On top of all that, the auction was a bust, leaving Mrs. Lincoln publicly humiliated and stuck with a hefty fee to get her wardrobe back. 
Lucy Hayes, wife of President Rutherford B. Hayes, caused a minor scandal with her support of the temperance movement, which opposed excessive drinking and its accompanying social ills. In fact, the president banned alcohol from all White House functions, likely to court temperance voters. Lucy supported the ban, writing, I have young sons who have never tasted liquor. They shall not receive from my hand, or with the sanction that its use in the family would give, the first taste of what might prove their ruin. Although it was the president who instituted the ban, temperance organizers gave her all the credit, with temperance leader Francis Willard praising her for making abstinence fashionable. But the praise was a double-edged sword. The Washington Post wrote, She compelled the diplomatic corps to astonish their stomachs with cold water for the first time in their lives. And after a presidential dinner, Secretary of State William Everts commented, It was a brilliant affair. The water flowed like champagne. Some staffers tried skirting the ban by spiking drinks and fruit to create what one reporter called life-saving stations. One staffer even won up the First Lady by having her serve cake, which, unbeknownst to her, had been spiked with rum. Mrs. Hayes' reputation as a killjoy was cemented, and she became known to her critics as Lemonade Lucy. On June 2, 1886, 21-year-old Frances Folsom married President Grover Cleveland in the only ever White House presidential wedding. The president, who was 49 at the time, had known the bride since she was born. Francis was the daughter of a longtime friend who, when he died, made Cleveland the girl's guardian, a fact which some critics spun into scandal. In 1889, the St. Paul Daily Globe, a pro-Cleveland Minnesota paper, made a case for the innocence of Cleveland's relationship with Francis, writing, As the child grew to womanhood, the bonds of affection drew the girl and her guardian closer and finally strengthened into the bonds of love. The paper cited an alleged exchange between Cleveland and an eight-year-old Francis in which she said she wanted to get married in the White House. Cleveland responded, apparently as a joke, that he thought she was going to wait to marry him. In the end, contrary to expectations that he was marrying her mother, Cleveland married Francis. But the May-December romance didn't become a major scandal, likely because the press celebrated the couple with congratulations, best wishes, and veiled references to promises of policy reform. The positive coverage turned Francis into a superstar, fashion trendsetter, and advertising icon. And somehow the public uh, went crazy for her. Her popularity was viral. Businessmen used her image to endorse their products, often without her permission. And later attempts to smear her as an adulteress failed. The Clevelands had three children together. In 1919, Woodrow Wilson suffered a stroke during a tour promoting the World War I ending treaty of Versailles to the American public, leaving him partially paralyzed and unable to fully execute his duties. The words, however, paralyzed were never utilized. Uh, you never heard the term stroke. Uh, uh, and from that point on, the American public was kept effectively in the dark. Wilson didn't resign, and the 25th Amendment, which would have allowed Vice President Thomas Marshall to act as president, had not been ratified. Article 2, Section 1.6 of the Constitution could have passed the presidency to Marshall, but he wouldn't accept unless Wilson stated in writing that he was incapacitated, and Congress declared the presidency vacant. Given the situation, First Lady Edith Wilson stepped in to fill her husband's role. If I don't help him be president, what a kind of wife am I? In her memoir, the First Lady wrote that she acted on the advice of Woodrow's doctors, who insisted the president's resignation would derail his vision of the League of Nations and kill the Treaty of Versailles, Wilson's only incentive to recover. Edith had her husband's full trust, so she followed the doctor's advice and became the presidential gatekeeper, deciding which matters and people merited Wilson's attention. In doing so, she effectively became the de facto president. There was gossip that something was amiss in the White House. The public was aware of the stroke and the fact that Wilson was being shielded from guests. Interestingly, however, observers and Wilson's opponents concluded that the president had gone insane, something Edith vehemently denied. It wasn't until after 1920 that the public learned that Mrs. Wilson had actually been running the White House all that time. Florence Kling Harding, dubbed the Duchess for her ambition and dedication to her husband's career, was a power behind the throne in the Warren Harding White House. She was determined to propel her husband's career along. She was determined to be an advocate for women. She was determined to protect her husband's legacy. Unsurprisingly, as a strong woman, she faced her share of scandals. The controversy started early when the future First Lady was the subject of not just one, but two family scandals over her choices in men. The first resulted from her elopement around 1880 with one Henry de Wolf. To make matters worse, rumor had it that the pair never actually married but lived in a common-law arrangement. Florence had a son named Marshall, whom her father Amos Kling adopted. After that, she doubled down on the scandal by marrying Harding, then the publisher of the Marion Star. Mrs. Harding's biggest scandal by far, however, was a posthumous allegation from Justice Department official Gaston Means' 1930 memoir, The Strange Death of President Harding. 
Means claimed that Florence had admitted to poisoning the president. She reportedly had tired of seeing her husband change from a warm, self-assured man into a, quote, hounded animal as scandal after scandal piled up. So she put him out of his misery with, according to Means, no regrets. Historians, however, claim that much of Means' book was false. On the other hand, at least one allegation that Harding had an illegitimate child with Mistress Nan Britton had proven to be true. College-educated Grace Coolidge, wife of President Calvin Coolidge, was known as an educational role model for women. In keeping with this image, she was scandal-free, with the exception of one incident that the press blew up to suggest she was an adulteress. In 1927, the Coolidges were on vacation in the Black Hills of South Dakota. One day in June, she decided to go hiking, taking her Secret Service escort James Haley with her. They were supposed to return by 1 p.m. when the president expected her back at the house for lunch. However, she didn't return until 2.15. Grace apologized. Apparently, she had repeatedly stopped to pick wildflowers. Calvin forgave her, but he removed Haley from her Secret Service detail. The incident was ultimately a nothing burger. Because of Coolidge's anger and the removal of Haley from Grace's detail, however, the press suggested the long hike was an excuse for a tryst with Haley. After all, he was a young bachelor, and the two were known to have a very friendly relationship. Although the accusations were unfounded, that didn't stop papers like the Boston Herald from running suggestive headlines like, Wife's Long Hike Vexes Coolidge. President Herbert Hoover's wife, Lou, triggered a race-related row in the summer of 1929. She was due to host a White House tea for congressmen's wives, including Jesse DePriest, wife of the only black congressman, Oscar DePriest. A black person hadn't been entertained at the White House in decades. President Hoover was courting Southern voters who feared civil rights leaders would use the priest's visit to fundraise for their cause. While Mrs. Hoover respected her husband's political aspirations, she made sure Mrs. DePriest was properly received through the use of a clever compromise. Lou's solution was to host several teas. The spouses of congressmen who might take issue with DePriest's presence were scheduled for earlier events. And DePriest was scheduled for the very last tea, an unsegregated event whose guests, mostly wives of cabinet members, were vetted for their racial attitudes beforehand. The event itself was a success, but it drew anger, especially south of the Mason-Dixon line. Texas, Georgia, and Florida officially condemned her actions, and a constituent from Austin wrote a letter to Mrs. Hoover saying, Texas is so disappointed in you. At the time, the country was deeply divided along racial lines, and while Northern and Midwestern journalists saw the priest's invitation to the White House as a decent thing to do, Southern writers insisted on being shocked and insulted. The Savannah Hawkeye published an article reading, The white manhood and womanhood of a once proud and self-respecting South hangs its head in shame and despises the nauseating spectacle. It turns out that Lou Hoover's scandal was just being on the right side of history. Eleanor Roosevelt's close relationship with journalist Lorena Hickok has drawn historians' interest because, at first glance, it seems borderline romantic. A 1979 New York Times expose noted that the pair's 3,000 letters contained highly emotional language. For example, Hick, darling, oh, I want to put my arms around you. I ache to hold you close. The phrasing has led some historians to conclude that the First Lady and Hickok were sexually involved. Such a relationship would have been a major scandal in 1933, and contemporary observers were suspicious. Eleanor, however, didn't much care what people said about her. In response to the letter's publication, Eleanor's son, Franklin Roosevelt Jr., said, Today we don't understand that kind of love which occurred between people who needed each other and gave to each other. Today, membership in the Daughters of the American Revolution, or DAR, is open to any female descendant of patriots who fought the American Revolution, regardless of race, religion, or ethnicity. In October 1945, however, things were a bit different. Time reported that the DAR had banned black pianist Hazel Scott, the wife of Congressman Adam Clayton Powell, from the Society's Constitutional Hall because it was for white artists only. In response, Powell demanded President Harry Truman discipline the society. Truman said that he couldn't interfere in a private organization's affairs. The Civil Rights Act, which outlawed race-based discrimination, hadn't yet been passed. Bess Truman, who is an honorary member of the DAR, then inserted herself into the row. She telegraphed Powell, saying, I deplore any action which denies artistic talent an opportunity to express itself because of prejudice against race or origin. But Bess didn't resign from the organization. In fact, she attended a DART that same afternoon in her honor, which made it look like she actually did sanction their racism. In the end, the issue became a brief national scandal. Powell clapped back, saying, From now on, Mrs. Truman is the last lady. After that, ordinary Americans decided to make their views heard. Among the most poignant was a letter to Mrs. Truman pointing out that Hazel Scott had been denied a performance even after she had raised money to fund World War II. Referring to black soldiers who had died in the war, the letter said, 
In light of their sacrifice, it is a shocking fact to realize that you refused yesterday to give up a cup of tea and a box of cookies to support the thesis for which they died. Jackie Kennedy remained scandal-free as First Lady, in contrast to her husband, President John F. Kennedy, who faced rumors of multiple extramarital affairs, including with Marilyn Monroe. Mrs. Kennedy did, however, face a minor scandal over her second marriage to Greek shipping magnate Aristotle Onassis. Apparently, various Kennedy relatives and other interested parties wanted to stop the marriage and used Catholic doctrine to support their objections. Why Jackie married Onassis is uh, an enigma which will probably never be solved. Uh, it was a great shock to all of us in the family. The issue at hand was Onassis' divorce from his first wife, Athena Lovanos. Since Jackie Kennedy was a Roman Catholic, she couldn't marry a divorced man without an annulment of his previous marriage, something which had to meet a specific set of conditions. Although Onassis' Greek Orthodox Church had given him a divorce, it was unclear if the Catholic Church recognized it as an annulment. Cardinal Richard Cushing defended Jackie, who was a friend. He'd married her and JFK in 1953 and presided over the president's funeral mass a decade later. Cushing called the rumors of her excommunication as a public sinner nonsense. But a statement partially contradicted the Vatican, whose spokesman told Time that Jackie, quote, knowingly violated the law of the church by marrying a divorced man and was thus ineligible to receive communion. Jackie married Onassis anyway and received last rites before her death in 1994, suggesting she had either stayed in the church or reconciled. Scandal knocked on Nancy Reagan's door in 1991 when author Kitty Kelly published Nancy Reagan, The Unauthorized Biography. The book made some shocking allegations, accusing the former first lady of running the White House with Ronald Reagan as her puppet, smoking marijuana despite her Just Say No campaign, having an affair with Frank Sinatra, and living a promiscuous lifestyle in college and during her Hollywood career. All of this ran counter to the wholesome reputation the first lady cultivated during Ronald Reagan's term in office. Washington Post editor Karen Tumulty defended Nancy, telling Slate, Nobody deserved this. Although the allegations stung at first, Mrs. Reagan appeared to get through it mostly unscathed. This was likely due to a combination of factors. Ronald Reagan was no longer in the White House, social media didn't exist, and there were no political points to score with decades-old rumors. But Newsday columnist Harrison Salisbury suggested the charges were nothing new. The media had just ignored them to maintain access to the Reagan White House. For her part, Nancy doesn't seem to have personally responded to the book outside of her husband's statements. Hillary Clinton has been embroiled in numerous scandals, either in tandem with her husband, President Bill Clinton, or during her tenure as Barack Obama's Secretary of State. These range from accusations of financial misconduct in the Whitewater and Cattlegate scandals to allegedly mishandling the 2012 Benghazi embassy attack. And while she was First Lady, the White House was sued over her role in an attempted 1993 healthcare overhaul the GOP dubbed Hillary Care. There were greater concerns about the influence that the First Lady might exercise on policy. In 1993, the New York Times reported that Bill had nominated his wife to head a panel focused on overhauling the American healthcare system. This was the first time a first lady had been given an important policy assignment, but she didn't draw a salary, which made her status unclear and thus created transparency issues. This led to a lawsuit from several healthcare lobbies demanding panel records. The plaintiffs argued that the Federal Advisory Committee Act of 1972, known as FACA, required any committee or task force containing members from outside the federal government to meet publicly. They argued that Mrs. Clinton wasn't a government official, which subjected the panel to FACA disclosure requirements. She defied the traditional role of First Lady to become a major political player. The administration won an appellate court when Judge Lawrence Silberman ruled that Hillary's presence on the task force didn't automatically require public disclosure, overturning a previous ruling. But in the end, it didn't matter as the Senate shot down the health care legislation proposed by the panel. As First Lady, Laura Bush remained scandal-free, despite the turmoil of her husband George's presidency, which included 9-11, the global war on terror, and the invasion of Iraq. In 2000, however, information surfaced about a car accident during her teenage years that killed the other driver. According to a 1963 report from the Midland, Texas Police Department and an Associated Press report on the incident from 2000, 17-year-old Laura Welch was driving after dark with her friend Judy Dykes on Highway 349. When they came to an intersection, Laura missed the stop sign and hit another car, sending both vehicles spinning off the road. The driver of the car that was hit, 17-year-old Michael Douglas, was killed while Dykes and Laura were taken to the hospital for minor injuries. It's unclear whether she was speeding, and she ultimately wasn't charged. In response, Laura Bush issued a statement through spokesman Andrew Malcolm, saying, To this day, Mrs. Bush remains unable to talk about it. Mrs. Bush's only other statement about the accident was that it was, quote, crushing for herself and Douglas's family. 
press, perhaps out of respect, didn't make it a campaign issue. The First Lady finally broke her silence in her 2010 memoir, Spoken from the Heart, explaining that her inattentiveness, the darkness, and the size of her car all contributed to the accident, which racked her conscience for years afterward. Melania Trump has mostly avoided the spotlight since leaving the White House in 2020, but in February 2022, she resurfaced to respond to allegations of running a fake charity. The New York Times reported that the former First Lady was raising money for a charity called Fostering the Future, which was supposed to help foster children access higher education and job training. I will be proudly grant scholarships to the children, uh, to students who deserve it. However, no such organization was registered in either New York or Florida, and thus didn't appear to exist. The details are a bit unclear, but the Times reported that at least one scholarship with an identifiable recipient had been given out through the initiative. Florida law requires charities or any organization raising charitable funds to register with the state, so an investigation was launched into the paper's allegations. Milani responded to the allegations on Facebook, posting, Dishonest reporting at it again. Read with caution. Typical corrupt media. Mrs. Trump said that she was simply working with a donor-advised fund called Bradley Impact to decide where to funnel charitable donations in support of foster care. She insisted that all procedures were being properly followed. In a separate statement to Business Insider, her spokesman clarified that, Mrs. Trump does not operate a 501c3 charitable organization. Fostering the Future is the platform's name and a part of the Be Best initiative. So far, there have been no major developments in the case, and the allegations have died down amid her husband's slew of federal and state criminal charges. The official Biden love story is that Joe met Jill at a fundraiser, saw her picture, and decided he wanted to date her. So Frank Biden, Joe's brother, gave him her number. Joe then called her and asked her out on a date to a movie in Philadelphia. But the Biden marriage's origin story was cast into doubt when Jill Biden's ex-husband, Bill Stevenson, claimed the truth was less wholesome. In September 2023, Stevenson appeared on Newsmax's Greg Kelly reports. Stevenson said that he'd been friends with Joe before Joe and Jill got together and that he'd supported and even bankrolled his Senate run. Stevenson claimed Joe repaid his support by having an affair with Jill, calling her story about the Philadelphia movie date a lie. Instead, he alleged Joe and Jill went to a Chinese restaurant when she was still married to Stevenson, and one of his friends allegedly saw and photographed them together. In response to a separate interview Stevenson gave to Inside Edition, Jill's spokesman said, These claims are fictitious, seemingly to sell and promote a book. In Mrs. Biden's version of the timeline, she and Stevenson separated in the fall of 1974, and her relationship with Joe Biden didn't begin until 1975. 